In today's show, we're talking to Richard Stamen of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. We're talking NBA draft prospects. We're going to talk some interesting guys. Kobe Bufkin, Asar Thompson, Seth Lundy. Yeah, he's been rising up. We're going to talk about all those guys. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. You can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at LockedOnFantasyBasketball. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LockedOnNBA for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. All right. NBA Draft. already gave you the big names, Kobe Bufkin, Asar, Asar Thompson. Um, and we're going to also talk about Seth Lundy, Nikola Jurisic, and Mike Miles Jr. on today's show. Some interesting second round guys and two, uh, you know, two lottery talents and, of course, a potential top six or seven pick in Thompson. So that's the first time we've covered one of the Thompson twins on this show. We're going to do it with Richard Stamen, um, who you've seen on Twitter and on Locked On NBA Big Board many, many times and on this show many times as well. So we might as well bring him in. All right. So here he is. Richard Stamen back on the show. Richard, welcome. Hey, good to be back. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We're ready to talk NBA draft. You're obviously really busy this time of year, so I'm not going to waste your time. And what I'm going to do, though, we're going to talk the five players that I've already mentioned at the start of the show. But I want to ask you, as I'm asking everyone that comes on, top five picks in this draft. We know who they are. It's the Spurs, it's the Hornets, Blazers, um, Rockets, and then Pistons. So what would you do at each of those five picks? Quickly, just run through your top five. Yeah, I think the top four is a staple at this point. I, I'm pretty confident it's going to be Victor Wembanyama, Scoot Henderson, Brandon Miller, Amon Thompson. Now, at the fifth pick, it becomes a little bit more open. If I had to guess, my fifth-ranked player would be um, – I, I would take Taylor Hendricks. Oh, so would I. Let's go. I, I really like him. I think he's one of those ceiling raisers. He's more than just a 3 and D guy. He's really skilled. He's young. I think he would make the the Pistons a, a very high level team down the road, and you know Cam Whitmore is probably the highest ceiling pick. I, I think mm. he's who they end up taking. But if it were me, I would take Taylor Hendricks. I would do the exact same thing that you did. I don't think it's going to go that way because it does appear that really every mock draft that I'm looking at over the I looked I looked at a bunch yesterday. Um, who was basing a lot on team intel. It's just like everyone's just moved Brandon Miller into number two. And I wouldn't do that. And nearly every draft analyst I've had on has said, no, I would take Scoot, but it does maybe appear it's going to go that way. I'm glad you said Taylor Hendricks at five. I like that. But now we're going to talk about five players. We start with talking about um, a guy that you are a little bit higher on than the consensus. So let's hit the, let's hit the stinger. Bang! Bang! Kobe Bufkin, a guard out of Michigan, he is like everyone in this draft, as I always say. He's 19. Everyone in the basically, you, we could see 20 players go in this draft, Richard, who are all 19 years, or not 19, freshmen or 19, because there's three freshmen who are 20 at the top of the draft. But Kobe Bufkin's a guy that I don't really think was on the radar much at the beginning of the season, but it's worked his way up and pushed himself ahead in a lot of circles ahead of his teammate, Jed Howard. So he's in the mock drafts I've looked at, he's going as high as 10, he's going as low as 26. Let me ask you this, like, when you say you're higher on him, were you looking like definite lottery? Are you going higher than 10? Like, where are you on Bufkin at the moment? Yeah, I, I would take him comfortably with a 10th pick. I mean, I think he's that good. You look at somebody who is 19 years old. He really has no notable flaw. His one area you could pick apart, I guess, would be that he's not got great point guard experience. This last year was really his first year running point guard. And when you're a first year point guard and you're pretty solid, you're not, you're not getting turnovers. You're not making mistakes. It's like smooth is the right way. It's not like it's not sticking out one way or the other. I think that's pretty positive. And again, he's 19. The, the free throw percentage indicates the shots real. He has a high motor He can play defense. He can crash the board feel for the games there. Everything checks out for him. So he's obviously skinny as shit. Six foot four, 175 pounds. Um, 
Is he a point guard in the way that Bones Highland is a point guard? Like, is that the sort of point guard that's more combo guardy, where you sort of run some stuff where Bones can do that a little bit, but probably shoots a little bit too much at times? Is that is that where Kobe is, or is he more of a high level passer? Because I, I think in general, outside of um, yeah, Scoot and the Thompsons at the top, the, the passing talent of this draft is probably a little bit lower than some other years. So where does Kobe sort of fit in with that group? Yeah, he's not he's not a traditional point guard by any means. He's also oh, I don't think he's like Bones Highland per se. I think he's more like a very true combo guard. He's somebody who's going to play off ball a good amount. He's also going to play on ball and you know when it's almost a your turn my turn type of offense. Yep. Uh, not not like the full time, but when you look at sometimes every I feel like every NBA team does it. When that happens, he's going to be able to be successful in that role. So whichever way you put him in, whether it's more traditional offense, whether it's the your turn, my turn, he's going to be able to thrive as a ball handler and just an overall guard. So you're, you're high on him. I I am a little bit lower on him, but I am coming around to it a little bit. I think the, I do think the shot is real. I think the ball handling is pretty strong. Defensively, I do have some worries. He's got size, obviously, 6'4". Is, nearly everyone seems to be that tall, apart from Scoot, who's also got the gigantic wingspan, which sort of makes up for it. But I guess one of the things I look at with players uh, that are like Kobe here, that, that handle the ball and profile as combo guards who shoot a lot, why is his usage only 22%? Like a lot of these guys, it's not quite the Dalen Terry 14% level from last season. It's like you're a point guard, but you'd never do anything. What? Why is it that low? Is it a scheme thing? Was he not aggressive? Because it's not like the assist numbers are making up for it where he's averaging seven assists and setting everybody up. Is that just a function of what Michigan was doing? Yeah, I mean, Hunter Dickinson ran the offense as a center. So the entire offense went through the post. Jet Howard took a lot of shots being uh, just a, a shooter who had way more freedom than he probably should have had. So when you have basically 24 shots going around just those two, you're pretty split. Like you got to take what you can. And I, I think that's why the usage was lower than most guys in this range. I think one of the things that, that I look at in the draft with a lot of these players is you know, I'm a big sort of you know, take best player available sort of situation unless it's two centers who really can't play together if you're at the top of the draft. Like that's where I start to get, yeah, maybe you don't do it. But with the guys who play the two, the three, the four, even the one who can slide across the two, I don't worry because there's a lot of, um, yeah, you can fit these guys together in many different ways. And this is a long way of me going about it and saying, like, what sort of situation does Kobe Bufkin probably not work as well in? Like, where, what sort of situation would he thrive and where, not necessarily team-specific, but where it sort of minimizes his talents? Yeah, I, I think it's pretty much somewhere that there's too many guards in front of him. It's a heliocentric offense. I don't think he would necessarily thrive in something like that because that's more he has to make decisions in very, very quick offense. And I, I just don't think he's ready for that as a pure off-ball player. So I think anything like that would probably hurt him. Maybe some of these post-oriented ones, like I don't like and that's not even a threat really, actually, now that I think about it, because I was thinking like Embiid, you know, I don't know how well it fit with him depending on if Harden comes back or not. But I think most of the teams in the range, there's only one team that it'd be kind of an awkward fit on, and that's Dallas because they run that heliocentric offense. Which, interesting, is pick number 10 with Dallas there at, at that spot. Yeah. But I think we all don't really expect Dallas to keep that pick and to, to move on from it. Um, yeah, you're right. So, like, is, is his strength... In terms of shooting, we know that we we not no we feel like he's going to be a good shooter. Is his um is it catch and shoot stuff? What's his pull up shooting off the dribble like? Yeah, you know, rim finishing with a slender frame is there. Which one is of those is the biggest strength? Which one is the biggest weakness? Yeah, he still has to improve his off the dribble shooting. His catch and shoot's pretty good for the year. He shot thirty five percent on catch and shoot. It's fine off the dribble thirty four percent from three thirty seven and a half percent from two, which overall is thirty six percent, but. You know, it doesn't really pop, but there's enough enough flashes where you're like, okay, he had a few games where he really was able to beat guys off the dribble and, and just stop and pop. So I think there's a lot of potential in that regard. He's an interesting player, again, someone who sort of has risen up over the second half of the season and through the draft cycle and continues to, to push up and impress. We're going to get back in a second to talk about a player that you're a bit lower on, the consensus. But before we do that, I'm going to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by the Game Time app. You might be looking for tickets to whatever it is, sporting events, concerts, comedy, musical theater. Richard, what would you say that you would look for on Game Time? Would you looking for sporting events? You're going to a nice stand-up show. You're going to see some ballet. Like, what's, 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 the thing? what's Richard Stamen doing in his off time? 
you know, if it were up to my girlfriend, we'd be at concerts left and right, but I'm going sporting event. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, pretty sure I would be too. And if you want to do that, you don't even have to plan it in advance, Rich. You say, you know what? I feel like I want to watch something tonight. Let's see what tickets are available on game time. They've got the flash deals there. They've got the game time guarantee as well. So if you see that ticket uh, in the same section and the same row for less, game time will credit you 110% of that difference back. You get views from the seat. You can buy the tickets in seconds. They're sent straight to your phone. You don't need to dig through your emails to go and find them. So download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Locked on NBA for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create that account. Redeem the code Locked on NBA for 20 bucks off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right. That will bring us into a player that we're going to just smack a reality check on. Bang! Bang! Now, I feel like I'm always mispronouncing this guy's name. It is one of the Thompson twins. It's Asar Thompson. Am I am I pronouncing that incorrectly? I just feel like I'm hearing it multiple times. What what, what, what are we before we get into the details? Am, is that wrong or right? Yeah, no. I I've been calling him Asar, but then I've started seeing more and more people start saying Asar out of absolutely nowhere. I've heard 50-50 on both. So as long as you say one of those two, you're not going way out of left field on that. I think you're fine. <laughs> so this is a really interesting player. Obviously, we know the Thompson twins. I mean, I'm finding it really hard, and I'm sure you are even more so. Is how to evaluate what we see out of Overtime Elite. Like we saw one player play in the NBA from Overtime Elite last season, not really until the end of the season. That was Dominic Barlow. And let's be honest, he played pretty bloody well. I thought he looked good towards the end of the season. I thought he should have been actually drafted um, instead of being that undrafted player. I thought he looked really, really strong and he's probably got an NBA future. So I don't really know what to make of this. The, there's going to be plenty of criticisms of the Thompsons in terms of the age. Let's just dispel that. They are older. They're in terms of them and Brandon Miller, are, could easily be the three oldest players picked in the top 20, both over 20. Well, all three of them over 20. So there's there's that age factor. And the thing that Richard people will look at, and I'm not sure if this is why you're lower on us are than others, is that the level of competition and the the younger, they were going up against a ton of younger players, um, which made them look better than they were. I've heard that criticism. Do you buy into that? Yes and no. I think it's interesting, first of all, just the age. Like somebody who I like a lot, Mike Miles out of TCU, is three months older than Brandon Miller, four months older than the Thompson twins, and he's a junior in college. Yeah. So like there's when you put them side by side, yeah, it's not good. It's not ideal that they're 20. Um, you know, that's that's just not ideal at all. But uh, at the same time, yeah, it's hard to evaluate over time elite. I agree with Dominic Barlow, like he should have been uh drafted, but they play against some good talent. Like the, the OTE is getting a lot more talent. Like they have mm. top guys on every team, but where it gets me is there's a few things. Some of these, there's really no scheme. And, and just like some of the habits, I think that the, some of them, uh, like Asar namely has on the court, uh, not like anything toxic or anything. It's, it's literally just like he picks up his, the dribble too much. And my worry is, all right, if you're doing that against OTE, what's it going to look like against, NBA pro, uh, prospects, you know, and we didn't see him scrimmage in the combine. They have absolutely no reason to. They could drop very badly if they played poorly. They had nothing to gain, but it's really just how do you like every flaw gets maximized and every pro gets minimized, right? So it's hard to really evaluate these guys fairly, I think. Yeah, it is. It's going to be tough. Like, and it's it's even. I was talking to someone one on one of these shows last week about the G League Ignite guys. Like, we've seen it for three years, but it's six players. Like. It's six players who've entered the NBA, and I still don't really know how to fully evaluate all that. And you know, when people talk about back to the Brandon Miller scoot stuff, they go, "It's got to be Brandon Miller." It's, like, it's because you've been conditioned to see college basketball for thirty years, forty years as this number one thing. It's on it. it it seeps into your consciousness through it's in on in bars. It's around you. Everyone's talking about it. So you think, oh well, these guys are doing this at this level. And we don't really know how to evaluate G League. And now over time, Elite comes in. I still don't know. And you look at these numbers. These are per thirty six numbers. 1.6 blocks and 3.5 steals are legitimately insane numbers. Eight assists per game. But a lot of the players playing there, like I was looking at um, another overtime elite guy, yes, I think Jazzy and Gortman, who averaged like 3.2 steals per 36 as well, which are like, again, crazy, crazy defensive numbers. And I think we have to we have to read into that with a pretty significant grain of salt, though, some of those defensive numbers. But I guess the criticism of Thompson is it, there's that, there's the dribbling stuff that you just mentioned, is the shooting. Um are you just not confident that it's ever going to be fixed and he could turn into, because obviously these are, he's an absolutely elite athlete, like, but is it Dennis Smith who was an elite athlete and still can't shoot? Yeah, it's, it's a few things. One, I, I think the defensive numbers are real. 
it, it is inflated a bit probably like just because it's not going to be like that day one i had a coach at ote tell me you know asar is the best defensive prospect i've ever coached and that says a lot like at any level he, he's been multiple places like that that's a lot so for me i think that does that does have value but the shot is concerning and this is just for both twins Asar is the better shooter, yep. and he shot 30% from three and 67% from the line in OTE. Those numbers aren't going to get better right away in the NBA. So what worries me is if you look at just college guys who shoot 67% or below from the free throw line, most of them actually don't become good shooters. Some of the bigs do that had it, but if you're not a big man, if you have that low percentage, you really don't ever come around. I think the only one I can think of is Avery Bradley, who shot 55% at the free throw line and was a what about, career like 36 shooter. Didn't uh, didn't Lonzo shoot poorly from the free throw line at UCLA? He did. That's another good yeah. example. He was, but he was right there. He was at 67 and a half. Okay. So yeah. like it was right there. That's one of the few use cases, right? Yep. And, yeah, that's... and I think Lonzo is a comp, like in mm. a weird way. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think Lonzo is a true point guard. Asar probably won't be a true point guard in the NBA. I think there's a lot of similarities. So. You said he might be a triple. He's obviously big, like they're six, like six listed six seven. I think they measured in at six six um, at, at the combine, so a little bit shorter than that number that's up there. Um, is he like a guy that they'll give the ball, or will he play like on the wing? Like I don't really know. Sort of say, for example, um, I don't even I can't think of the, the the perfect team, like the the Magic, like playing next to say Markel Fultz. Like, does that make sense for him there on that sort of a squad? I actually don't think so. I I think you can't have him and Fultz play together. I mean, that's Fultz is struggling still off ball. Yep. That worries me. What I like about him, because his passing skill is just incredible. I think he's the second best passer truly in this class behind his brother, Amen, who the difference is Amen's a better live ball playmaker. The difference is Asar, I I think he's better as an off ball playmaker, right? Where he comes off the screen, gets two dribbles, his decision-making, whether to go to the rim or pass, is elite, and his ability to make those passes is elite. No matter what the competition is, I think that's that will translate up. But if you're not putting enough pressure on the rim and you're not shooting consistently, that skill gets massively negated. Like Passing is one of the easiest skills, I think, to get negated in the NBA, and that's what worries me for him. In terms of you know, being lower on him, I, so there's a, a significant range of his draft picks, 5 to 10. But over the last day or two, as I've been updating my mock draft database, I have seen multiple mock drafts place him higher than his brother, which I I've, I hadn't really seen at all until the last week or so. So are you how out on Asar are you? Do you think that it is fair? Like, would you clearly have Amen ahead of him? And like, are we talking that you're at like 8 for Asar or 12 or 15? Like, Where are you with him? Yeah, I'm not out on a star. I just I'm out on him being a point guard early on in his career. I think that can grow, but if you're expecting him to to be that point guard full time, I just worry. There's too many examples of him picking up the ball, just stopping his dribble with a head of full of steam against OTE against six nine, six ten guys. And that worries me. How are you gonna do that in the NBA when you have Brooke Lopez right there? Right? Like yep. you're not gonna finish through him. So he's got a long ways to go in that regard, maybe the spacing helps him but it's not like the spacing was that bad in OGE there weren't that many post-ups things like that so my thing is is he's got to shoot I think the defense will always keep him on the court because if you ask any GM their whole method of why they want someone is what can they do to get on the court right now and Asar is going to automatically be a positive defender it really for me is just I don't know how much of a positive he can be on offense that's really where my reservation is at least for early on and maybe I'm looking at it too short-sighted but I think, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but some of the vibe I get with both uh, Asar and Amen I is the overtime elite stuff and that the fact that they people don't take the league seriously or they don't take the competition seriously. And there's a little bit of a vibe of, well, this is an, an easy cop-out for these guys to have gone here. These guys don't have great character. They're playing in this freewheeling league and don't care about fundamentals. Is there any truth to any of that stuff? Because it... Are the reports I've heard from people who have spoken to us, it's like unbelievable, like legendary kid, really, really great, head screwed on, positive, unbelievably hard worker. But I still hear that other stuff like, oh, he goes here, he doesn't want to work hard, just want to muck around and, and you know do highlight stuff. Like that's not really the problem, is it? No, that's if you hear anybody say that they're they're lying. I mean, yeah. I, I talked to too many people at the NBA draft combine last week, where uh, varying sources of it. Some people in the NBA, some in higher media just too many some other agents and every one of them said you'll never hear any knocks about a SARS work ethic or amens they both love basketball they yep. love the game 
it's not their fault that they're in OTE and they took his second year in it, right? I mean, like, you can't really fault them. I guess they could have gone to the NBA last year, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it's their choice. Like, and, and if they're putting in the work to be better every single day, how can you knock that? Yeah, no, look, every, every person that I trust or listen to says the same thing about them, but you just hear that that gets out there and sometimes it snowballs and people, it's, it's just a weird thing because of the unknown, again, of what Overtime Elite is that people don't really understand how the program grows. We're going to come back and talk about a guy that you did reference earlier, Mike Miles Jr. We'll get to him in a second, but today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks all the way through the NBA playoffs and into the NBA finals. Price Picks is giving someone a chance to win $1 million. One entry that's placed after 8 a.m. Eastern. We randomly selected each day, and you get a chance at becoming a millionaire. That entry with a six pick flex will get the following payout. You get six out of six, a million bucks. Five out of six, you get 80,000. You get four out of six, you get 16,000. And all of this is Price Picks. It's daily projections, fantasy projections, or stat projections, and you go over or under. Points, rebounds, assists, steals, fantasy points, whatever it is, and you combine them all together into one entry. Every day, one person gets picked. You go to pricepicks.com slash million. You opt in at that link. You get all of the details, and you become eligible for that million-dollar entry. And once you opt in, you just play the game like you normally would. And you can do it for the NBA, but you can do it for other sports too, NHL playoffs, Major League Baseball. You can do it for NASCAR, cricket, golf, boxing, MMA, disc golf. Of course, why wouldn't you want to do disc golf? So go to pricepicks.com slash million. But you can also, if you're a new user, download the app and sign up. And you can use our code Locked On and get 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. Deposit 100, you get 100. Deposit 50, amazingly, you get 50 as well. Don't forget to enter the promo code Locked On at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100 and get yourself in for that million dollar opportunity. I said we're going to talk Mike Miles, and maybe we'll do it right now because. Uh, yeah, he is a guy, and I have heard you. I think you did. You did the prospect pitch for him on Locked On NBA Big Board, didn't you? And then I heard. Uh, then I heard Raf say that uh, Mike Miles listened to that and said, "Man, I want to hire you as my agent." So you're here to to pump up Mike Miles, a guard from TCU. He's 20 as well. Like as you said, he's like four months older than than uh, the Thompsons and Brandon Miller. Six two, probably going to be a second round guy, but 36 percent shooter from three, 60 percent true shooting, high usage guy, 20 points per 36. Um, I'm not going to lie, like when I hear, you know, heard Mike Miles and who you're talking about, I thought, oh, is this Mike Miles? Yeah, it sounds like a white guy shooter. No, like he's like this stocky 6'2 guard who's, he looks really interesting as a player. And just from looking, just at the picture that's on the screen, looking at the build, looking at the college, I go, oh yeah, I've, I know a guy that had a sort of stocky build who was a, a guard that came out of TCU who's doing a fair bit of damage for the Grizzlies at the moment. So what's the difference between him and Desmond Bain just purely on the fact they both play for TCU and they look like they're jacked as shit? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I asked him. I, I I asked him what's in the water in Fort Worth that's making everybody who wears number one at TCU get the the even wingspans. And and he thought, you know, he laughed. He's like, oh, man, I I extended. I really thought I was going to get a plus wingspan, but he did not. So the real difference is, uh, I mean, Desmond was one of the best shooters I think pre-draft I've ever seen. Mike's really good. Like he still shot forty-two percent on spot up, right? Yep. He can still shoot off the dribble, but he's more of a true point guard and. Probably, honestly, I think his instincts defensively are better than Desmond's, which says a lot because Desmond's feel for the game is just unbelievable. So I, I think they're different in the way that point guard versus off guard is how I would describe it and shooting differences. So again, 6'2", there's not a huge amount of guards or point guards in the NBA who are successful at the moment at that height. Like it's almost a requirement that you are six foot three. Obviously, Scoot is 6'2", but he's like 6'9", wingspan. It's a plus seven. Like that's that doesn't make you 6'2". Like that makes you a lot bigger than that. There's nearly everyone we look at like that are successful is taller than this. And all of the guys that are in the top, Anthony Black, six foot seven. Casey Wallace measured, I think, over six foot four uh, yesterday. Is that height a problem? What? Where does it impact him? Does it you know, finishing at the rim? Is it getting across around big men? Like, what's where is that height going to hamper him? The only issue I see on defense, or excuse me, with his uh, size, spoiler alert, is his defense. Where he still though is so strong and quick that he can stay in front of guys. It's it's the same problem Desmond had, right? Where these shot contests. Um, they're not they're not going to be as lethal because he's he's short he's shorter and he doesn't have long arms but i don't think finishing at the rim is actually an issue the first two years he he was a sub 50 percent shooter at the rim this year he got up to like 65 percent and he plays so much bigger than his actual size that's that's one of the things i really like is he's fearless going to the rim and he's successful going to the rim too because he added so much strength he plays bigger than his size and he's comfortable with both hands can play through contact like the finishing is all the way there for me 
I was going to ask it with Miles, but I might go on to talk about the next player, and that is Seth Lundy, who is another guy who's, at the moment, getting a ton of buzz. Like, had some really good combine stuff, shot 40% from three, another 61%. True, uh, true shooting player, 6'6", six, six wing, but he is older, 23 years of age at Penn State. He's probably going to be, if drafted, all a second-round player, but I haven't seen him actually appear in any mock drafts that I looked at yet, so he might have jumped into one or two of them. But I think I use this question about Seth. We'll talk about him in a second. But the addition of the third two-way contract coming in, what do you think that does to the second round of the draft? Does that lead to more of those situations where agents are like, hey, don't draft me. I've got these other situations lined up. How do you use that, that is impact it? Whereas, you know, usually after, say, pick 45 those guys that get picked, they're like they're significantly worse a lot of the time than the undrafted players. How does how do you think that's going to change things? Yeah, I think it might make it more extreme where more guys get drafted because they want they're okay with taking the two way. They just yeah. want to hear their name. Whereas I think somebody like Mike Miles, I mean, I talked to a couple of NBA scouts at the combine and they said, you know, we think he's better than a two way. We may not draft him, but we know he's better than a two way. And that kind of thing makes his stock for example hard to say seth lundy may not want it to it he may think hey like him and his camp they may say hey we we know we can he can shoot the lights out like that's a day one trade that's not a two-way guy that's a that's a day one end of the roster spot and if you draft somebody you may say all right we have to give you the two-way if we let him go undrafted you know they may not honor that desire and say hey we might we want to sign with somebody who's all in on us and and thinks that you know he's worth it so I think the two ways gonna the third two ways gonna change a lot in that regard. Back to Lundy, he obviously shot really well from three, forty percent as a shooter um, last season for Penn State in his fourth season. But shot thirty under thirty five as a junior, thirty two percent as a sophomore, thirty nine as a uh, as a freshman. But that was on uh, really small minutes, like fifteen minutes a game, and only three attempts per game. So is this one of those cases that I'm always skeptical about? Shout out to Davion Mitchell of becoming a good shooter as a senior and does that translate? Is it real? Like that? Because that's that's a red flag to me. I think it's real. The free throw percentage for the last three years has been pretty safely north yep. of eighty percent, which is always a strong indication. When I talked to him at the combine, I asked him. I said, you know, what changed? Like you were an inconsistent shooter, and and he acknowledged it. Like he didn't take it as a slight. I said, what changed? And it was a really mature response. He goes, you know, I told my teammates I want to do whatever it takes to win. I was a good defender as a junior, but. I needed to shoot the ball better. So I did everything in my power to become a better shooter as a senior. And I worked in the off season to get it and the results showed. So I, I think he truly is a good shooter in the combine scrimmages. He was doing everything. He was shooting standstill. He was hitting movement. He was hitting step back threes. Everything you can ask for for a shooter, he did it. So I actually feel like it's pretty real. I yeah, look, you're right, the free throw is really interesting over those three years and he shot eighty seven percent as a junior on his free throws when he was only at thirty four percent from three. So that is a good indicator. He shot the ball really well. There's a lot there and he needs to be able to do that. But if we're gonna talk shooting and three point percentage, we're gonna talk Nikola Jurisic because um yeah, those numbers are pretty bad. So he is a six foot eight wing, played for Mega B Max, um, obviously from uh, yeah, Nikola Jokic's former team, and so many um, uh, Balkan players came out of that that team. He's just another one. He's not not a center, obviously, six eight wing, probably a second round player, but that's just terrific. Forty one percent from the field, twenty four percent from three. Not a good free throw shooter. He averaged seventeen points per thirty six, five assists, and one point three steals. Is really interesting. So, is is this what he is? Is he a yeah, Asar Thompson. Is he six foot seven wing who can pass but can't shoot? Look, because they, they are honestly just horrible numbers. Like, you know, honestly, you look at white guy European, you go, okay, you can shoot, but he can't. So, what is he as a player? Because he is getting drafted in basically every second round mock that I've seen. Yeah, he, I mean, he's young. Um, I think that helps him a lot. He's still pretty new, 19. I don't like the shot. He was somebody who I liked at the beginning of the season. I liked him in uh, the FIBA events a year, two years ago, but. I haven't seen much this year. I, I became lower on him. I saw him at the combine during his pro day. I, I think he's going to draw a ton of flagrant fouls because he jumps from the three point line to almost the free throw line, just how far his shot goes. And I think that might be some of the consistency. His landing spot is so far away from his takeoff spot. That might be an issue, but his touch overall, it's a little bit flat. It looks like Chandler Parsons shot that line drive. If you remember that, yep. he's a good passer. The biggest thing I heard over the week at the combine was because I would ask people, you know, like he's an intriguing guy, six eight guard essentially. Is is the motor real? Like he has to have a consistent motor, which he just hasn't had it in Mega. 
Yeah, that, that, that is a problem um, from watching some some stuff with him. It, it is a little bit of a concern as to where he sits. And again, someone, you know, one of the mock drafts had him at like 39, and I, I'm, I'm not convinced with it. Again, someone who's playing on the wing, who's just that poor of a shooter and has motor concerns. Like, yeah, look, he's young, but, you know, the... Going to be forty drafted players who are nineteen or, or close to twenty. Like it's not, it's not a standout skill for him. Like there are plenty of other players who have more translatable skills or have shown those skills that have also age on their side. So that's, that's all well and good, but I, I just I fail to see um, the huge positives with him. The passing numbers are intriguing. So is he? You know, we talk about the lack of probably passing skill just as an overall thing through this draft compared to some other years. Is that a real standout skill for him, or is it a little bit inflated? It's a little bit inflated, but at six eight, I think the inflation becomes okay, right? Where you're like, yeah. I can I can live with some inflation on it. The ability of that size is too good to deny. Yeah, and that that is that is interesting. That size is there. Um, do you think that he would? He's an intriguing second round player in large part because he might stay overseas for a year or two. Yeah, I think he stashes. Um, I, I don't know much about him personally. He may want to come over. Some of these guys, like Nicole Jovic last year, was insistent. I'm like, yep. he's like, I'm coming over. I don't know if Durasic is going to be the same way, but if he does stash and and you know brush up on some of his habits and tendencies, I think he could be a really good investment long term. Look, that sort of size, that sort of passing is obviously useful, and any team can use it. But you got to be able to do a bunch of other stuff as well. Defensively, can he hold up, or is it is that a problem too? It's all about his motor. I think he can be fine, but he plays himself worse defensively than he needs to be. There you go. That brings us to the end of talking about those prospects. We hit on a couple of second round players or three second round players, Lundy, Jurisic, and Mike Miles. We talked about Asad Thompson. We talked about Kobe Bufkin at the start as well. And Richard, you're going to be talking about lots of NBA draft prospects on your Twitter account, which people can see on the screen at Mavs Draft, but also on the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast. What do you guys got cooking over there at the moment? Yeah, we're we're doing a lot. We just recapped the entire combine. Every every video was you know at the combine itself, so we're cooling down from that, reacting to that, seeing how things have changed. And with the withdrawal date coming up, I think in a week. Yeah, I think it's thirty first, isn't it? That. Yeah, I think it's the thirty first at midnight. So. We'll be covering that from there on out. It'll be, we know who's in the draft and uh, we're breaking down everything that really no one else is doing. Yeah, Locked on NBA Big Board has so much great stuff and yeah, tomorrow's show, I'm going to have Raf Barlow on from Locked on NBA Big Board. So we're going to be doubling up on the Locked on guys for NBA Draft for tomorrow's show. Richard, thanks for coming on and chatting NBA Draft with me. Thank you. And that will do it for today's show. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And on YouTube, thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. As I said, Rafael Barlow is going to be on tomorrow's show. And we're going to, I'm actually going to record it straight after this, but we're going to, he's going to be on tomorrow's show. And we're going to be talking, who are we talking about with, um, with Raf? Let me just have a look because that might be interesting information for you. Who's me and Raf going to talk about? Derek Lively. Well, that's Derek Lively. We're going to talk about on that tomorrow's show. One of the most interesting dynasty fantasy rookies coming up. One of those guys, he's the the Walker Kessler, the guy that, oh, where's he going to get drafted? Because his stats said he's unbelievable. Can't wait to talk about that with Raf tomorrow. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.